What's up everyone? Alex Boylan here, co-founder of Dream Jobbing, and I couldn't be more excited to do Dream uh, Five Questions with Jeff Wald, a veteran among veterans, legend among legends in this in the entertainment business. Uh, he's in the Personal Management Hall of Fame, managed people from Mike Tyson to Sylvester Stallone to bands like Crosby, Stills and Nash in Chicago, and the list goes on and on. Creator of the Contender. Um, so, thank you for taking a little bit of time. It's my pleasure, I guess. <laughs> and, uh, all that build-up just means I'm very old. <laughs> still alive. And God still has more character than you, know, you can imagine. So, I guess the first question, um, as you know, this, 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 these videos are a lot of them for younger people that are trying to break into the business and, right. and debating on my what to do. Right? <laughs> exactly, right. the next generation, right? Yes. Um, how did you break into the business? I was a fan of, of a particular singer-songwriter when I was in NYU in college, and used to listen to his records all the time, and then um, saw he was playing at a club in the village, and went down there, and uh, got myself backstage, which wasn't odd in those days, there were not a bunch of, right. you know, oversized uh, guys blocking you, and uh, he wasn't that big a star then, and uh, wound up becoming friends with him, and uh, taking care of some stuff he needed taken care of. And uh, wound up moving to Chicago and moving into his house. And uh, I learned a lot of my politics from that. Uh, he lived down the block from Elijah Muhammad, and I got to meet Malcolm X and Martin Luther King, Jesse Jackson, who I'm still friends with, uh, James Baldwin, Ray Hansberry, a lot of people from uh, the civil rights movement mm -hmm. in those days, and uh, helped form a lot of my politics. And uh, he was my first client and uh, managed him while living in Chicago for six months and realized I knew nothing. So I got a really important job in the mail room with William Morris, uh, part of which was changing the liquid soap in the men's room. <laughs> and I mean, it's great jobs there. <laughs> and, every, I mean, it's, and that's interesting because to this day, right, William Morris Endeavor, one of the largest agencies out there, um, you still have to start in the mail room, right? I was, yeah. Now you need a law degree or college, <laughs> college graduates and that. But I was there at the same time David Geffen was, and, uh, and he's done okay. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, you know, so it, it, it was, I, I learned that because I got to work in the legitimate theater department, I worked in the nightclub department, I worked in the concert department, um, and then left and went to another agency, and then wound up uh, through all the contacts I'd made getting another job in Chicago, this time on the north side. And uh, I was a talent buyer for a string of clubs, Mr. Kelly's, the London House, Happy Medium, and the Pussycat go go And Mr. Kelly's played people like uh, Woody Allen, and uh, Richard Pryor, and Flip Wilson, and Dion Warwick, and Sarah Vaughan. A lot of those relationships I kept. And the London House played uh, jazz, like Cannibal Adderley, and Ramsey Lewis, and Miles Davis and people like that, and uh, the Happy Medium did little book shows. I stayed in Chicago 10 months, but I hate the cold weather, my lips get checked. I'm the same way, I'm from Boston yeah, originally. Yeah. Okay, yeah, uh, so. I've been in Boston. <laughs> and um, so, basically, uh, Bill Cosby came into the club one night. I'd known Bill slightly from Greenwich Village, and uh, you know, I sat down with him, reintroduced myself, and uh, told him, I said, geez, I'd love to move to California. Walk, get out of Chicago, and he said he had just started a company there with, two, with his manager and another guy. He said, give, give my manager a call, give me the phone number, and it was called Campbell Silva Cosby, Silva being his manager, Roy Silva. And so I, I called the guy up, and he gave me one of these, well, kid, if you're ever in California, give me a ring. So I flew out that night, and showed up at his office at 9 o'clock in the morning before he did, and he was sort of impressed that I didn't wait. Uh, hired me on the spot. I went out and got an apartment in West Hollywood, put the first and last month down, flew back to Chicago, quit my job. <laughs> I was married, had a kid, and we drove from Chicago to Kingman, Arizona without stopping. And we stopped because I wanted to go to a driving movie to see Endless Summer. Oh, yeah, a lot and, of classic. And, and, and it was playing with an Elvis movie. First, my daughter, who was about four at the time, was crying because we didn't have a pickup truck. <laughs> and uh, and, and uh, it, what happened is they ran the Elvis movie, which is really was garbage. And uh, then the guy starts putting the lights on. People left. I said, no, I wanted to see End of the Summer. He said, well, everybody left. I said, not everybody. I'm still here. I paid to see End of the Summer. You don't want to get in a fight with me. Trust me. So I said, you're already part of the thing that's 
1987, arrived in LA with $8 in cash, but I had a job, and uh, got lucky right away. My first big act was Tiny Tim. Started exactly. out as a joke and turned out to be not funny on many levels. Right, right. Well, it's interesting, because you, you, you grew up in the Bronx. I did. You had a tough upbringing. Bronx. What do you think it was, or what were you doing, or what did you do back then? Because you go from tough upbringing, right, and you get into the, all of a sudden you're, you know, Cosby, and you're looking at um, William Morris, you're getting jobs there, you're getting all these like famous people are starting to say, hey, why don't you manage me? What was it that you were doing at that point from going from, I don't want to say street, but you're going from the streets, right, to like, now streets you're... Streets are street. a great education. Right, and survival, just, and it gives you... Uh, Kind of movies, you know. Right, and you're going so, from there to now you're you're hanging, you're young, you're hanging out with all these famous people. My, How does that happen? My, my father died when I was three days after my eighth birthday while I was talking to him, brain aneurysm, and uh, my mother's a school teacher. Basically, uh, she used to refer to me as that one to my younger brother. You're not going to turn out like that one. No, my brother's a doctor. My father was a doctor. My grandfather was a doctor. Uh -huh. I was not going to be a doctor. All right. I had no interest whatsoever. Did not like school particularly, but I did well in the SATs, and I even took the LSATs. Came my fifth hire in New York State and decided I don't want to be a lawyer. Uh, I didn't want to be anything. You know what I mean? I just wanted to make money and get out of the Bronx. <laughs> so, as a motivation. So was it just the hard work that was just opening these it doors? Was just, it was just what was opening the doors is not being afraid to approach people. Yeah, that go and introduce yourself and talk to them, and um, you know. And I always said, if I didn't have a sense of humor, somebody would have shot me years ago. <laughs> you know, so that helped. Um, you know, and also delivering on what I said. You know, so I, I made up my mind a long time ago that, that not I could be an asshole or a jerk or a liar. And lying wouldn't work for me because I'd never remember the lie. If you tell the truth, it's the same story all the time. It's right. the truth. And you can tell now what's going on with our president and everybody. They're all getting in trouble for lying. So I, I never lied. So I had integrity. Uh, I was always honest, maybe sometimes too honest because I didn't have a big filter. Mm -hmm. You know, if somebody asked my opinion, I gave it to yeah. them and they didn't always like a real opinion. Right. So, but, um, so but in a business, right, where, I mean, do you think that that was part of the success of you being able to have this unbelievable career where in a business where maybe people sometimes, you know, kiss butt, right, say the right thing? You know, to just to kind of go along and you're saying, I'm just going to tell the truth. I, 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 think, I think that's to, to depend on the people. The people I manage were secure in their art mm -hmm. and their talent, and I brought different things to it, too. For example, George Carlin. Uh, George Carlin was wearing a suit and tie when I met him, skinny tie, but no less, and he was doing very hit material in the 60s to the wrong audience. He, he got fired in Vegas, he got fired on Beat the Clock for his language and all the rest. And so um, I approached him. He was also from the Bronx, by the way. He went to Cardinal Hayes High School. So I approached him and uh, and said to him, I said, you, you, why don't you do this material? But wear a t-shirt and jeans and just grow your hair and whatever and look like the hippie to be where the man you're portraying <laughs> right. instead of some guy in a dumbass suit. <laughs> and so I used to brag that the year that, the, the year that I got him that year, he had made about a quarter million dollars, which good money in the 60s, and the first year with me, he made $12,000, okay, <laughs> but it, I took him in from the Vegas venues to the Troubadour, to the Hungry Eye, to all the smaller clubs around the country, doing that material, and then the relationship I made at Mr. Mr. Kelly's in Chicago with Flip Wilson, by then Flip had his own TV show, and he had a record company called Little David Records, so I made a deal for George to make an album for Little David, and it sold three million copies, so he went from 12,000 to almost $2 million the next year, and had a career. And um, uh, at the Deep Purple, I inherited, uh, uh, we, when I worked for Cosby, we had a record company called Tetragrammaton Records, and the first record we put out was by the Deep Purple, Hush, and I set them up on a tour, and we toured the United States with uh, Cream, which is our Clapton's group at the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was real rock and roll time. And uh, uh, just, it's, things just parlayed. And so I've always said luck is preparation, meeting, opportunity. And we all have luck, but a lot of people don't recognize it. Mm -hmm. And not being afraid to just go up and introduce yourself and talk to people. Otherwise, I'd probably still be a virgin. <laughs> you know? I mean, that's it's great, it's, it's, it is, it's great advice. What 
what's your favorite part of the entertainment business? I love the energy. I love the feeling of seeing something from its inception to its fruition. So you, with you know Helen writing, I am woman in bed, and uh, next thing you know, it took nine months, but it was the number one record in the country. It won a Grammy. It became an anthem to this day. You know, it's still being sung at uh, different rallies and everything. So, and then you know, but any, any of the artists and being around, they've written something or we recorded something new, and now you pull up at a, at a light. And People are singing the song in their car. Yeah. We go to Japan and they may not speak English, but they know the English lyrics okay. to a song. And uh, uh, we got to go to, or I got to go to 51 countries, my kids. Uh, went to most of them too. And what people save up their whole lives to go, we're going for free and getting paid yeah. and getting treated nicely and getting to meet. I met the Queen, I met, you know, met all sorts of people. Um, and I was never afraid to meet people and to introduce myself. And um, I had another mantra. I love cliches. Uh, well, you know, it's good. Cliches, yeah. cliches and cliches <laughs> because they actually work. And one of the cliches that I love is there's, is there's no losers, there's only winners who quit. Yeah. No losers, only winners who quit. That's a good, solid. You know, so you have to stay with it. You've got to have a dream and, and try to execute the dream. It took me five years to sell the contender. Took me hooking up with Mark Burnett. Yeah, and the Contender, you know, a huge hit show, the boxing competition. Just our fifth season. He created that. <laughs> what created Mark made it better. Yeah. You know, so you have to know, you have to learn what you don't know. You know yeah. what I mean? Um, uh, and I prided myself in discovering people in the beginning of their career. So uh, Will Smith came to me. He had had one hit, and Russell Simmons brought him to me. He had written a song. Well, I think I could beat Mike Tyson. He couldn't get in touch with Mike Tyson or Don King. In those days, he was not anybody. Mm -hmm. uh, I put him on the phone with Mike, and a week later, he was making that video. Uh, <coughs> and then I put him in a bunch of my shows. Didn't manage him, but I liked him. You know, I thought he had a great personality. Yeah. Libby Newton-John was another woman from Australia, my first wife. And that was the other thing. I met my first wife on Friday and married her Tuesday. It's our 18 years, two kids. Yeah. Rather than making a movie out of part of our life and the feature. And uh, uh, my second wife, I actually dated. That only lasted four months. And my current wife, one of the three, I proposed on the first date. She moved in me on the second date. That's got, amazing. Got married five weeks later. We're married 28 years and I have a 20 year old. It's awesome. So, my so when it comes to you know, instincts, don't waste time. Yeah, it, 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 your instincts sometimes are better. If, if you overthink, yeah. I see more people miss opportunities because they overthink of what if, what if, what if, what if. So they're worried about failing. You have to think about success and not worry about failing. I've failed on things, I've, and I've done some stupid things. I had a young lady writing me these notes and, and letters and sending me uh, cassettes and back in the day to listen to her stuff. She was a friend of mine's secretary, and I thought, oh, God, I, another one of those things. And my secretary sings, you know. So I stuffed it all in the drawer, didn't pay attention, and then one day I pulled out the thing, looked at it, and it was Faith Hill. Because <laughs> I've made, I made mistakes. Right. I, you know what I mean? Um, it's not a perfect world, and uh, I'm not perfect. And you got to be willing to, to acknowledge your mistakes and try to learn from them. So what I learned from that one is you never know where something's going to come from. So the next time something that I ordinarily might have passed on, an 18-year-old kid, came in my office, uh, my secretary said, this kid drove him to Omaha or something. Great, 18, and he's got a song. Everybody has a song. And he played me the song, and I loved the song. I brought it home, and within six weeks, it was number one all over the world. It's called Angie Baby. And uh, of course, I listened to this 18-year-old kid's song. Um, you know, and uh, it's it just, and you gotta be not afraid to take chances, yeah. and not afraid to fail. And not let the failure kick you where you, you can't function. Yeah. You know, yeah. Life is not just one upward uh, movement. You have to figure out what your goals are. My, and my goals would be involved in politics, to be involved in education. I think education is important, especially now, because you have to, as an adult, make informed opinions. Not informed opinions gave us Donald Trump. You can hurt me. Mm -hmm. And so, um, Politics is always important to me, and when I made money, I gave scholarships to kids. You never know who's going to 
find a cure for cancer, or who's going to yeah. invent the next whatever. And uh, so you have to, you have to, to, to he was given much, has to give back yeah. much, you know. Yeah. Uh, and that's another cliche. Yeah, I didn't great. say it right, but. Uh, no, yeah, yeah. The much is given, yeah, much is asked in return. Yeah, it's, Thank it's, you. It's goes, that goes back to the Bible, right? I mean, yeah, it's 100%. Well, let me ask you this. Um, what's the most challenging part of this business for you? Or what don't you like? I don't, like, I, don't, I don't like lies. I don't like bullies. I don't like cheats. You know, it's it's stuff when you look at the, the joke is in, in the history of music business, there's never been a statement you got that they didn't hide money someplace. You know, that you didn't have to audit. Same thing with the uh, uh, with the with the networks and the, and the studios. Um, but I managed Jim Brolin for 35 years, and we did a show called uh, Well, we did a bunch of, but he had. Show called Hotel. It was an Aaron Spelling show, and we put profit participants in it. And because Aaron Spelling got a big license, we, we started getting profits year one, which is unheard of in television. The show ran six years, and we got profit statements for 13 years. Started out with seven figures, you know, got less at one time. And in year 14, we got a letter that said, to Mr. Brolin, Mr. Walt, as you're probably aware Viacom has bought the Aaron Spelling estate. Aaron had died. And uh, due to a change in accounting procedures, we find hotel in the red $3 million. You know, that it, it annoys me. Yeah. You know I mean? It annoys me for people not to get a second chance. Marvin Gaye was totally screwed up. Uh, we were friends a long time, but he was in England. He was a tax exile. He couldn't pay his taxes. And so he was living in England. He was doing drugs. He, I said, if you get yourself clean, I'll find a way for you to pay your tax and come back. And he did, he got clean. I mean, this is the short part of it. And he came back and had a big hit with Sexual Healing and a big hit album. And, uh, you know, so you, 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 you got to be willing to take chances also. You want to help somebody and wind up helping yourself. Give back, right? A little bit? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but, but, yeah and sometimes you don't even have to. I'm not uh, Mother Teresa or anything like that, you know, but. Sometimes the giving back just comes naturally, you know, for, I, I love Marvin's talent. I love him as an artist, he was a friend. So that's how that came about, you know, sometimes, uh, um, yeah. you know. So for, um, just so you guys hear that noise, that's Jeff's uh, dog, dog uh, over here. Um, uh, final question, or really more of a statement, you know, for the, for this, you know, you're coming from a tough area in the Bronx and with this just unbelievable storied career. You know, I love to talk to the kids that aren't in Los Angeles a lot, right. the kids are in Florida or in Omaha, Nebraska, or wherever they are, Kansas, that's thinking, I want to work in entertainment. And this guy's done it all. Where you, it's, where, it's, where it's you music. come from is not a jam. Yeah, music, you know, music, movies, television, movies, television all that, you know, what Politics. would your advice be to them? Don't be defined because you're looking around your neighborhood and it doesn't look like you want it to look. You know, I watch Father Knows Best on TV and look at my family and think, that's got to be some sort of a joke. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So I, I was jealous of that kind of thing. You know, I didn't have to leave it to be the house, lived in an apartment, you know. Uh, it wasn't very big. One full bathroom, you know, and uh, uh, my brother, myself, my mother. Eventually, stepfather, who I didn't talk to. Um, so, look, don't be defined by where you start. Think about where you want to be, you know, and how you want to get there. Hard work, you know, I did all sorts of jobs. I sold Holland furnaces. I worked at a rent a car place. I, I, I worked as a riding instructor to some of horseback riding, and, but I had to clean the stables as well. You know, so it's just. Um, he was telling me a story before we started this. You were talking about back in the Bronx that you were delivering between newspapers, the butcher for everyone making yeah, as much butcher, money as mom. The man, the, the, <laughs> the, uh, the pharmacy, the newspapers. So my mother was making $100 a week as a school teacher. I was making 100 a quarter doing deliveries. You <laughs> yeah. know what I mean? Hard work will get you places. Yeah, this, and there's nothing to be afraid of with hard work. And it, it pays off. But I, I didn't have a goal. I must admit, when I'm carrying... A, wooden box gave me splinters and the shoulder with fruit in it and the meat was dripping through the blood in the, in the paper bag, you know what I mean? And uh, the, the kind of people who could squeeze the, the buffalo off a nickel, um, you know, for, for their tip. Um, I didn't think, oh, one day I'm going to be a star in show business. I didn't think about show business. It was 
was of seeing an opportunity to meet somebody whose music I liked and creating a dialogue and then he liked me and we liked each other and it just developed from that. And once I started in that, uh, I liked the money. There was a lot of money in show business. But it wasn't the motive. I didn't think when I met him or whatever, wow, I'm going to make a lot of money. I thought, this looks like something like going to be fun. Yeah. And then as I did Passion it, and purpose. Yeah. And then as I did it, I realized I didn't know anything. So I wasn't afraid to go backwards and go in the mail room. I was married with a kid making $55 a week, $99 every two weeks I was taking home. I had a little side action going on stuff to keep me going, but, um, you know, it was, and it was not taking no for an answer, you know, for my first wife, who wound up with 11 platinum albums, um, I couldn't get a record deal for five years. I was having a commercial voice, da, 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 all these stories, and I never gave up, nor did she, you know, and uh, she came here from Australia with $100, and, um, you know, you, you, you don't, like I said, there's, there's no losers, there's winners who quit. So if you really have a dream and you believe in it, you keep on going. The dream could go sideways, it could take different shapes. So you have to be adaptable. You have to learn to just see, okay, it's not exactly the way I dreamt it, um, you know, but it's close enough that I could make this the dream. You know what I mean? If that makes sense. Yeah, make, making the best any sense. I, that's an era of the opportunity that arises in front of you. Yeah, I didn't know anything about television. William Morris assigned me to go to Brooklyn, which would be like a foreign country or something from the Bronx, to go service. And they said, all you got to do is knock on the doors of the people on the show and say, hi, I'm Jeff Wolf from William Morris, and, uh, and I'll be here all day. Anything I can do you know, you know, to help you, let me know. And they said, nobody will ever ask you to do anything. Just bring a book. You know, and the next thing I know, I had Marita Harry yelling at me about stuff. I didn't even understand the terminology she was using. I don't like my sides. And there was nothing wrong with your sides. look pretty good to me. <laughs> I didn't know any term or nothing. So I had to make a phone call. I had to go, you know, I, I knocked on the Three Stooges door and they looked up from their peanut game okay, and said, uh, William Morris in high school kids now. <laughs> you know what I mean? So you got to roll with the punches. Yeah. And I had to learn what the dialogue was about television. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it's, and, and uh, listen, I did a, a, a Broadway show with Muhammad Ali called Big Time Buck White. And I uh, was just married to my current wife. We're sitting on television and doing a documentary on Muhammad Ali, who I stayed friends with from 68, right till he passed. And so I said to my wife, they're going to get to the pub and talk about my show. And the announcer comes and they said, in uh, 1969, Muhammad Ali did one of the biggest failures in the history of Broadway. It's really terrible. <laughs> As I told you, we're talking about that show. So you got to be have a sense of humor as well about that. It, it's not just a straight shot up, not for anybody. And nobody goes through life with no pain or no failure or no something. You know, whether it, it, it's your health or, or you know, just divorce, yeah. whatever. I can afford the marriages. Divorces are very expensive, so try to stay married. <laughs> and uh, you know, and. Uh, I, I don't know what else to say, yeah. except that doesn't matter where you're born, that doesn't define you. You know, I'm not a religious person, but Jesus was born in a manger, okay? It didn't define it. You know, you, you define yourself with your ambition, with your passion, with your humor, with your, your ability to stay with something and not give up. And I don't care if your dreams are like uh, we were discussing to be a plumber. Plumbers make a lot of money. You know, plumbers, uh, Go get, pull a plumber to the house and see what it costs you. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? So yeah. whatever changes your status in life and your lifestyle or your families, that, that's, that's, that's okay. It doesn't have to be in the entertainment business. It doesn't have to be, not everybody can be Michael Jordan and play sports and, and do that. But there are a million things around those things that you could do. Um, and there are things just in life, whether it's being an electrician or a plumber or something, uh, the skill that you learn that you can earn a living with and better your family. And that's success. Mm -hmm. okay? Success is, 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 you know, look at your own judgment of what success is. Don't look at anybody else. That's the other thing. Jealousy will kill you. There's always going to be somebody richer than me, more famous than me, taller than me, had more hair than me. <laughs> I don't care. You're but right. not someone more funny than you. 
Maybe, maybe <laughs> well, my friend that way. That way so. But basically, yes. If I have, as I told you before, if I didn't have a sense of humor, I'd be, I would have been shot years yeah. ago. Yeah. So. Uh, well, Jeff, listen. I mean, this is amazing words of wisdom from an absolute legend. Thank you for doing my five pleasure. questions with. This has been a really fun, enjoyable experience. I appreciate I, I, it. I, I, for him to get to this point, that I told him I was going to do this naked. <laughs> you know, his partner, this was a good friend of mine. And uh, that's how we met. And so I love what they're doing. I love the fact that they're going to inspire whoever is seeing this in the boys' club, in the girls' club, in the schools. Look, look, you know, if this place can make it, you can go any place, okay? That is awesome. All right, guys, we'll see you soon. Cheers. Thank you. Oh, man.